Good evening and welcome to uh, Portland Place and a special welcome uh, to uh, Your Excellency, um, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, um, to the RIBA. I'm Ben Derbyshire, I'm the current uh, President. Uh, before we begin, a housekeeping point, um, which is to ask you um, not to use any audio-visual recording of tonight's event. Um, that's strictly forbidden and copyrighted uh, by Charles Jenks. Um, and we're filming the event uh, so that you'll be able to watch it on our website, architecture.com. Uh, so please uh, switch off your phones and sit back and enjoy this in real time. Uh, in a few moments, we will call to the stage tonight's award winner and speaker. Uh, but before we do, I'd like to add my own very warm uh, welcome uh, on behalf of the RIBA to the recipient of the 2018 RIBA Charles Jenks Award, Alejandro Aravena. Ladies and gentlemen. The award is given to an individual or a practice who has made, which has made, a major contribution simultaneously to the theory and practice of architecture. And I'm particularly looking forward to Alejandro talking about the relationship between architecture and social housing. It's a matter of incredible importance to us all at this time. So the RIBA Charles Jenks Award has premiated the work of very many talented architects, such as Bernadetta Talia Bui, Rem Koolhaas, Charles Correa, Wolf Pricks, Zaha Hadid, Jacques Herzog and Pierre de Meuron, just to name a few. So this year's winner, Alejandro Aravena, joins distinguished company as a deserving winner of the 2018 award. In fact, this completes a very satisfying trio from my first year as president of the RIBA of distinguished practitioners of social architecture. Neve Brown for our gold medal and De Reich Marsh Morgan um, for last year's Sterling Prize. Acute observers amongst you will have noticed that we have departed recently um, from uh, that uh, tradition, um, but that's perhaps a story for another time. The RIBA is, as ever, tremendously grateful uh, to designer, author, broadcaster, and patron of architecture, Charles Jenks, for his generous donation that enables this annual award. Through the work of Charles Jenks, his writing and his commitment to the benefits of great architecture and landscape, he has been an inspiration to architects for many years. And I'm only sorry that he can't be here tonight himself as he's recuperating successfully, I gather, from an operation. So now just to say a few more words about the award and its history, I would like to invite his daughter, Lily Jenks, to the stage. Welcome and thank you very much indeed. Hi. As Ben just said, this annual award is given to an individual or practice who has made a simultaneous contribution to the theory and history, sorry, theory and practice of architecture. So what is this combination of theory and practice? Why is it important? As a student asked me recently, why do we even have theory? What does it do? This award offers a theory of theories. If we look back at the people who've won the award, we see a pluralistic list. The common ground between Peter Eisenman, Zaha Hadid, Rem Koolhaas, Benedetta Tagliabui, Neil McLaughlin, to name a recent few, is that they display multiple intelligences. Their practice is always architecture plus another discipline, not just building, but also a medium out beyond architecture. That's philosophy for Eisenman, painting for Zaha, journalism for Rem, 
and the collaborative time design of Benedetta or the installations of drawings of Neil McLaughlin. The point is that theory should not be narrowly defined as a written text in the lineage of Vitruvius or even the idealistic, beautiful drawings of Serlio. This award asks that we celebrate multiple intelligences that great architectural work entails. The idea partly comes from Howard Gardner, who is a developmental psychologist and established the theory of multiple intelligences. He argued that value could be found not only in the narrow defines of the IQ test, but there are also linguistic, musical, spatial, body, kinesiistic, and emotional intelligences, to name a few, that he defined. The award was established by my father, Charles Jenks, in 2003, and he shares that polymathic tendency himself in his work as a critic, a writer, an architect, a landscape architect, a landform artist, and several others. And it comes partly from his writing about Le Corbusier, who could have alternatively pull out a model, a plan, a painting, a polemic. <clears throat> he was a kind of architectural Swiss army knife. <laughs> And using these different intelligences to drive his architecture, he drove the models, other models of production at the same time. The study of architecture, in architecture schools, the study of history has mostly been valid. The Bauhaus made a strong push to move aside history and establish workshops and laboratories as the move to creatively push architecture from the side. In the 1970s, we saw the rise of paper architecture and written theory. And history theory, so, so history became history theory, the workshop laboratory, and today it's the statistician, strip writer, the artist and activist. So if I come back to my student's original question, what is the purpose of theory defined in this sense? I expect it is the drive, it's the drive to take us into realms that we had not expected. It gives us the courage of our convictions and a critical sense of ourselves to see the work through other mode of productions and other techniques of thought. My sense is that tonight's winner portrays this clearly as an intelligence of engagement and a theory of synthesis. It focuses architectures, his architecture's ability to address today's most urgent and complex problems. I'm very looking forward to your talk, thank you. Uh, good evening. I, I'm David Gloucester. I'm Director of Education at the RIBA. Uh, thank you very much, Lily, uh, and a warm welcome to Alejandro and his colleagues from Elemental. Uh, now, I know there's always an issue with Support Act, so uh, I really will, I really absolutely promise to be as brief as possible. Um, it's a great pleasure to host this special event, celebrating such a distinguished architect and a body of remarkable work. It affirms the visceral, life-changing effect of great architecture. And perhaps we don't do that nearly enough. And this is architecture that so beautifully mirrors the issues that Lily talks about and the essence of Charles's aspirations for this award. Uh, Charles has a deep conviction that practice without theory is inherently problematic. Uh, but that theory needs to be tested through the revelation of realizing the architectural project through building. Uh, all of you should know uh, anecdotally that Charles is a remarkably challenging person to work with. Um, he elevates each judging session of the Jenks Award uh, to a different kind of level. It becomes a formidable intellectual exchange above anything else. So when Charles leans forward, his eyes flashing and his eyes moving from side to side to make sure that everybody is concentrating. He will say, but we should debate this. And you need to know at this point, not knocking the microphone in any possible way, uh, that your arguments need to be authentic, they need to be persuasive. You're, if you're making a nomination for this award, you need to be on firm ground. The decision to make Alejandro, the recipient of the Jenks Award, was not difficult. 
Alejandro's work is diverse, inclusive, highly tectonic, and personifies the architect as a versatile problem solver with unique gifts. Alejandro is an architect who, who has a manifesto, a sense of what the future of our urban centers will look like, an extraordinary talent for placemaking, placemaking that lodges in the individual and collective memory. And he, he and his practice work with an unfaltering moral and ethical conviction, and most importantly, produce very beautiful architecture. Architecture for the mind and body. And as I know, he will let you see in the presentation. Just to explain operationally uh, how uh, we'll finish off the evening, uh, we're very lucky to have Justin McGurk, who's the chief curator at the Design Museum, who knows Alejandro and his work extremely well. Uh, and after Alejandro's presentation, uh, he and Justin will uh, take their seat in the famous brown chairs, which are a fixture uh, of the Jenks Award, um, for a, a, a kind of Q&A session. This is essentially a way of finishing the evening uh, by personalising uh, some of the issues which Alejandro will present. But for now, lords, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce with great pleasure Alejandro Aravena. Buenas tardes. Good evening. Um, so I would like to start by thanking uh, Charles Jenks, Lily, the RIBA, and the jury for this award. Uh, so on behalf of Elemental, our practice, uh, who happens to have all the partners here, which I would like uh, to quickly stand up, Juan Ignacio Cerda here, Gonzalo Arteaga, Diego Torres, and Victor Odo. Thank you very much for this award. It is an honor, and at the same time, it is a challenge. It is a challenge because the relationship between theory and practice is challenging itself. So tonight, I would like to share in three ways, uh, to share three ways in which I have experienced such challenging relationship. First of all, how it was through the formative years, which I gave the title kind of thing to being as nerd as possible, yet skeptic. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to deliver a lecture in, in an environment that is uh, from within the discipline. Normally we have to talk with no architects. It's very unusual for us to speak to architects. So finally, to be able to be nerd again, it's a real pleasure. So it's fantastic. Second, um, a second moment where theory was only what was needed to face the problem of the blank page. And somehow it was the opposite of my formative years. And that's why I guess it's, uh, we call a mental not a think tank, but a do tank. Uh, and it's a challenging, conflicting relationship in any case. And finally, I would like to share, because uh, it's very much along the lines that what was just said, what is the possible connection between architecture, if there is such distinction, we don't believe it is there, but for the public opinion, there is the distinction with architecture, with a capital A, with the architecture of the everyday that we do with a lowercase a. Uh, so is there any kind of, of uh, transit of, and flow of knowledge from that capital A architecture to the one that we do? And then what do we bring backwards to that architecture with a capital A? There's, it's mainly filtering the superfluous, so no frills kind of architecture. So allow me to start with the, with the first part, which is the nerdy, skeptic uh, beginnings. Um, in this relationship between architecture and theory. I studied architecture from 1985 to 1990. These were the last years of the Pinochet dictatorship. And in that political environment, information control 
uh, was an issue. Actually, we didn't get any magazines. We were studying architecture only with old books, I guess, because they were less dangerous. Uh, and mainly looking at pictures of buildings, not at buildings themselves. <clears throat> so in those years, theory was equal to history. And I had to go through history one, two, and three. That was uh, a sequence of isms, mainly. These were awful courses to have to go through. Uh, history one from old architecture, history through, and it was mainly about classifying historical uh, buildings uh, that may be okay if you want to be a critic, but not okay if you had, and we have the problem as students of having to have a studio at the workshop at the same time. So the connection was very hard to build. In any case, my first challenging experience was around uh, understanding theory uh, as history. After third year, theory became a different thing, uh, which was mainly, to put it in some way, to speak in as complicated as possible. <laughs> so we were trying to use philosophers' jargon, uh, words with less than four or five syllables were not part of the question. Uh, so you had to pretend, and it was a kind of term-dropping kind of attitude, to show as if one was intelligent. And actually, we have just opened an exhibition in, in Denmark in the Luciana Art Museum, and we scanned for the first time all our sketchbooks and, and the, of that period. We didn't have an archive before that. And I have to confess that going through the sketchbooks, the way I was describing theory was really unbearable. It was, uh, un, un, yeah, it was so arrogant. It was so, uh, so I guess that myself had to suffer that notion of theory as a parallel uh, activity that was, again, not connected to practice, uh, but mainly trying to show that you were uh, a sophisticated cultural uh, individual. Of course, having had started with those do notions of, of theory as history or as speaking in complicated within the years of the dictatorship where, by definition, you had to be against what was official, uh, created that, that kind of rebellious attitude and that reasonable skepticism that, I guess, tempered how, at the same time, one was trying to swallow a field of knowledge, a body of knowledge, and at the same time being critical and skeptic of what you were swallowing. And I guess a good example of that could be uh, the project that I did in first year, uh, in, in third year, sorry, for a taxi driver. And in that studio, we were required to do an, an individual or a private house. You could choose the client, the, the mm, normal attitude would be to look for a client that was sophisticated enough so that as if from the quality of the client came the quality of the architecture. And of course, the least that you could talk about while explaining your project was Heidegger and was a void and existence, so, so that kind of really big words. And by being skeptic, I wanted to know what all that had to do with a friend of my father that was a taxi driver that wanted to park the, the cab inside the house because that was the only mean of survival and if it was on the street the next day wouldn't be there or a family that had the refrigerator in the living room because it was a sign of status. So how was that normal everyday life connected with that big architecture uh, was the kind of things I was questioning. These are the, uh, among the things that we did was to scan projects that were somewhere, finally we discovered that, and this was the third year uh, project of a, a house in the city center with a, for a very conventional client. And I guess this went rather well after being submitted to reviews. And I guess it's important that at some point during your formative years, you're encouraged in that being rebellious and being skeptic, because it would have been very easy for, for some professor to dismiss you. Uh, and I guess that was a turning point somehow, that in that 
critical attitude, you get some good feedback, and it encourages to keep on doing that. And I guess it's crucial for what we do nowadays. Uh, in anything, if anything, I would call our practice uh, a fight against the cliché. Uh, and, and this, uh, I guess, comes very early on in that notion of theory as being uh, as conscious as possible of the decisions that you're uh, intuitively making while designing. The second thing I would like to talk that I think is important in the formative years is the role, the role of, of my mentor and very important professor I had to happen in my very first year, Fernando Perez. He was at the same time professor of, of theory and workshop and studio. Uh, so he was saying, it's a kind of quote, of course he may have spoken about this more elegantly, but what I remember to have got is that the moment you open your mouth, you're thinking in public. So make sure that you think carefully, solidly, with clarity, aiming to sharpen the problem and the forces at play instead of using thought just to erase the edges of the problem or throwing big words just to get the audience or the client confused. From those very important formative attitude that I got from Fernando Perez, he was, I guess, trying to communicate all of us that we, were, we had to be in a, in a hurry to swallow the body of knowledge of architecture, both in the built and the written form. So his course was actually was not called History 1, 2, or 3. It was called Introduction to Architecture. Uh, a course that I happened to teach uh, afterwards following his paths. And there we got to get in contact with the Vitruvius, with Alberti, Palladio, Durand, Boulet, Ruskin, Loss, Corbusier, Mies, Kahn, van der Laan, Aldo Rossi, or Robin Evans, just to name a few. So it was important that at least one professor during that uh, period understood theory of, as that lessons from those who have the problem of the blank page in front, which I'm going to talk about uh, later. These were the, the, was the historical international body of knowledge that being far away in the corner of the world in Chile, we desperately uh, needed to have access to. But we had a couple of local examples Chile is not Peru, we did not have an empire, so it was, it was very hard to look for high quality architecture, there. but there were two experiments from the 60s that I guess that helped to create that uh, intellectual approach to architecture that gave some sense to the operations. The first one being the uh, school of, I studied at the Catholic University, uh, this was the Catholic University of uh, Valparaíso, which is a city 100 kilometers uh, on the Pacific Ocean. And they were trying to ex explore the relationship between poetry and architecture. This is a very unique example, uh, and a, a very original uh, approach. And actually, they were not just uh, studying or teaching that, but actually they were living according to that. Professors and students, uh, students were having this open city on the dunes, uh, on the seaside, making experiments of how some, in this case it's not theory, or let's say, but in poetry, as a way to find uh, an original foundational approach to what does it mean to put an object there in the built environment. So that was one. And the other one, somehow in conflicts and around the same years in the 60s, uh, Juan Borchers uh, trying to find the relationship between mathematics uh, and architecture. And actually, Borchers was a kind of thinker that wanted to put a finger in almost every aspect on of the human existence, from, from science to botanics to uh, um, biology, geology. Um, so even though they, they may have remained a little bit outside the conventional practice, there were this, at least there was an epic or a kind of a, um, sense that there's something here that matters. And I guess that 
that sense or that feeling or that emotional approach to knowledge was important from uh, these other schools that were brought through Fernando Perez to my formation in Universidad Católica in Santiago. A third moment in my formative years came from another professor for Fernando Perez being one I had in the first year, Hernán Riesco being one I had in my last year, uh, was a fifth year professor. And his way of, he was a practitioner, uh, but he ways, his way to approach theory, and uh, which I'm, I'm very thankful for, for approaching how to frame the problem of, of a project that way, was to put it as if it was a riddle. Uh, so he was trying as if every project that you have to deal with had an, a menu of problems that you had to discover and then and it's a kind of inevitable many of problems attached to each of the typologies that you're dealing with. So it was your task, first of all, to understand what does that menu was, and then to choose among that, because even if inadvertently, you may have been choosing something without knowing there was a choice. So questions like, how many ways are there to enter a building, as if there was a correct answer? Uh, of course, for, for us as students, it was natural. We never thought that it was his particular approach. Uh, but the framing the, the, the menu or the kind of things that you have to pay attention to was important. How many elements maximum can a student deal with uh, in a composition? What's the problem of an L-shaped building? What are the core problems of a tower? Um, and these kind of things I guess still today are relevant in how to frame the question before even jumping into the possible answer of a project. Designing the question in our practice is extremely important. We spend a lot of time initially in designing the question before, jump, before even jumping into the solution. So as the sum of one, two, and three, I guess that the, what was the, in that relationship between theory and practice was this rebellious, skeptic, nerdy uh, kind of approach, reading a lot, drawing a lot, and mainly measuring buildings a lot. Somehow, that, th that approach theory created the hurry to swallow those centuries of knowledge that we somehow felt we were missing while being trained in architecture in Chile. There was a fourth moment in the formative years, already outside from the university, that I would call the expansion in Venice. Uh, when I went to Venice in 1991 uh, to make, as if I was studying, I had to apply to a scholarship. I mean, who on earth would go to a classroom in Italy? All your professors are uh, their buildings themselves are on the street. So, but I need the scholarship to be able to survive in, in, uh, in Europe. So I went to Italy. Uh, mainly to be able to, to do the Voyage d'Orient de Corbusier in reverse. Uh, while being in Italy, I guess theory acquired a new dimension that, I, that I, it was unknown for me uh, in Chile, which is theory as culture. Old, for, for, to name a few courses I, I had to follow to justify my scholarship in, in Italy, old and modern tragedy, uh, literature, uh, the Divine Comedy by Dante, professors like Tafuri, Dalco, Cacciari, Orrella, um, where there was, for the first time in my life, we were, I was able to have a direct contact with the original treatise of, I mean, you went to the library and there was the original thing there from 300, 400 years. That never, ever would have been a possibility in Chile. But in addition to that, you close the book, go to the street and the buildings where, that you saw in engravings in the book were built. And this was just fantastic. Uh, so I followed the advice from Hernán Riesco, the professor, saying that, okay, if you go to Europe, make sure you take your sketchbook uh, to draw, but mainly your measuring tape. Make sure you measure all those buildings. Uh, so this is, I guess, What started as uh, the, the, the really nerdy years of, of my of, uh, formation, when I, I went uh, um, to follow the, the path of the Voyage de Rien de Corbusier, uh, going to Greece,
to then roam uh, Istanbul. or Palladio, both at the residential scale or at the, at the building scale. Uh, it started in, in 91, but actually never ended uh, for many years. I was coming back and, and forth and, uh, and over and over to old architecture, uh, drawing and measuring. Um, so understanding that architecture in that sense reflects the society that allowed it to happen, the technical and advancement and means that were available at the time. What was the sensibility of that society that were looking or allowed to do things in one way but not in a different one? Uh, were these uh, dimensions, and going back to, to words of Fernando Perez, he says that a good architectural wor uh, work is at the same time a mirror and a cloak. As a mirror, it, it's a cultural object that if you pay attention a careful attention to, it should be able to resist that careful look and to the point that eventually reflect as a mirror that period in time, that society, the advancement of humanity, or even the author. At the same time, a good architectural work is like a cloak that should be able to disappear in the corner of the eye so that you don't even pay attention to architecture and that place allows you to do what you're supposed to be doing, like meeting here. If we place with this eye attention to this auditorium and, and interrogate it as a cultural object, we should be able to write an essay of what the moment in time where this was built, the proportion, the acoustics and everything. At the same time, if this was not properly designed, we would be paying attention to it because it doesn't allow us to just meet and gather and have a conversation. So that going from being in background to being at the forefront to paying attention to not paying attention to it at all was the kind of things uh, I was trying to uh, investigate, understand where were the operations uh, that were put in place by the authors. Uh, and this was the Italian school combined with my formative years in Chile. So from that on, I guess I, I graduated in 92. Uh, my personal private practice started in 94 after, after going, having gone to Venice. Uh, so when there was the moment that after having swallowed all that body of knowledge, you have the problem of the blank page in front of you, theory, acquired a new dimension, which was, how do I make that jump into the void? How do I take that risk of doing a proposal? Because to make an analysis or a, um, as a research, somehow it's seen as, as less creative, even though it requires a creative eye to be able to penetrate the reality of a, of a built building. Yet the blank page has had a new dimension to it, which was, okay, how do I start with? How, how do I start that infinite chain of, of and process of uh, decision making? So I tried to organize all those experiences I had as a, as a student in the form of the courses I would have liked to have at the university, but I didn't. So from that where the years where I was trying to put into a written form all those lessons I was trying to extract directly from, from buildings, being uh, the most important uh, one, a, a book that uh, was written together with Fernando Perez and another architect, Jose Quintanilla. It, and, and I think the name is important, Architectural Facts. It was about trying to extract from buildings all those lessons that actually happened in a way because there were some form, the decisions in the form they had that produced that kind of life. So how accurate can we make the jump into the void from wanting something to actually delivering what you want and not doing something else? So. Uh, these were the, the and, and this was mainly about the the. Uh, my own uh, studies, and, and these were more collection of texts 
that also help that jump into the void, which is the, the decision making of, of trying to improve uh, and, and be better than the blank page. I was not interested in knowing about architecture. I was interested in learning from architecture because of that problem of the blank page. Somehow, to design is to prefer. And there's people that prefer better than others. I wanted to put myself on the footsteps of that infinite chain of creative decisions, the forking paths in front of the blank page. So I read, I draw, and mainly measure the sequence of small jumps into the void where intuition th synthesizes knowledge in order to organize information in a proposal key. I guess that my, it was a kind of hope that while measuring a building, you're going backwards to that moment where you have to choose, square or circle. If square, how high, how deep, what's the material? I mean, it's an infinite chain of decisions, and I wanted to be somehow guided by those that made better decisions than others. That, I guess that while measuring, you're able to connect very, in an intimate way, to that problem of the blank page in front of you. This coincided with the moment of my first building. The book was published the same year. I, I did my first building ever, which was the uh, mathematics faculty for the Catholic University in 1998, where, if anything, tons of concrete was being poured in front of my eyes and I have to confess I was scared to shit to have made a mistake while designing this building. I mean, it was really amazing. I, I'm, I don't know, was less than 30 years old. You draw a couple of parallel lines on a piece of paper, and those lines meant a wall. Hundreds of workers working there, you know, trying to pour the concrete inside the formwork, and I said, and what if I made a mistake with the, with the lines I was drawing that apparently was nothing? I mean, it was a piece of cake just to draw things. Well, those things were tons of material. It was money, it was energy, it was people. Uh, you actually never do your own stuff with your own hands. You do it through the hands of others. So you met to make sure that the instructions that you're giving are going to end well. So I guess that I, tr I was trying to, by, by drawing and writing, uh, to connect with common sense and a certain humbleness. Uh, it was a moment where I was forced to abandon theory as a pedantic rhetoric thing. Uh, it was so self-explanatory that if, if you were pretentious and arrogant and all those formative years with these big words while going on the, onto the construction site, this was a different thing. And so you better make sure that you use your words just for carefully directing your operations more than adding uh, stature or glamour to, to what you're in the end of building. That book, Architectural Facts, and that building that was finalist in the Mies van der Rohe Award uh, got me an invitation to teach at Harvard. And that was in the year 2000 and was the birth of Elemental. At Harvard, I learned the hard way that my theories and practices had to be confronted not with other architectural theories and practices, meaning with other architects, but with the theory of pra and practices of other disciplines. I realized I was so lost and so irrelevant in what I was trying to do as an architect. Because when you go to Harvard to the School of Public Policy or the School of Public Health or the School of Law and or Business, these guys are trying to deal with those really big issues of the world. And there I was with my nerdy knowledge of uh, architecture that only interested other architects. So I was trying, I guess I, I was forced in, in a very tough way to find a way so that theory or whatever architectural theory and practice was had a conversation with these other fields of knowledge that were trying to have an impact into reality. In the year 2000, for example, 
I did not, I did uh, know, and all these things that were uh, fancy at the time, fractal space, the constructivism, postmodernism, parametric design, but did not know what a subsidy was. In a country where 60% of what gets built uses some kind of subsidy. So the same way, there is a, I don't know the expression in English where you feel embarrassed for the person next to you doing something uh, awkward. Well, this was self-embarrassment. It was not possible that I didn't know what a subsidy was in a country where the majority of the square meters are built using subsidies. So in a dinner, with the Minister of Housing, it was a lawyer, my age, 33, and two engineers, among them Andres Jacobeni, studying at the Kennedy School of Government, that ended up being one of the founders of the Elemental. I was the only architect in a table of four. It was a unique opportunity to set the agenda, I mean, to talk personally to the minister. In Chile, I would have never, ever had the chance to talk to the minister. There I was on a dinner, being able, the architect on the table, was well, to talk about housing policy, and I didn't know what a subsidy was. And I just saw the ball pass in front of me, equal self embarrassment them, engineers and lawyers, talking about policy. They were deciding the future of hundred thousands of subsidies per year in a relatively small and poor country. And I didn't have a thing to say to contribute to that conversation. So my architectural theory and practice, and, and practice was no contribution to their social, economical, or public policy theories that, they were, that were trying to improve the life of millions in my home country. There I understood that my theories had to go underground and become intimate and silent, and be there in the, only in the private realm as the guide for the praxis to be able to engage in these non-architectural problems all the other ones on the table were talking about. As Hashim Sarkis said, at the time he was a college, college, uh, colleague at the Harvard GSD, and now he's the dean at MIT, he was saying that the challenge to architecture was to contribute with the specific knowledge of architecture, that of form making, to non-specific problems like poverty, insecurity, inequality, sustainability or quality of life, which are issues that every single citizen has the right to have an opinion and to which, in order to engage, we had to contribute with what we know to do best, which is to give form to the places where people live. So this connection between non-specific problems and the specific knowledge of architecture, which is that of making forms. And it's around those years that we started Elemental, uh, Elemental starting as a social housing initiative, and uh, we started by swallowing all the constraints and restrictions of a public policy, and just for you to understand what do I mean by constraints, it, it was, at the time, $7,500 subsidy with which we had to buy the land, provide the infrastructure, and build the house for a family. If you didn't follow those rules, well, you were out of the system. And those th three realms were split in three. So in the end, whatever you have had studied, and, and Palladio and Alberti and all that, well, you had to deliver with $2,500. Can you do that? So I guess that was the, the reason why all that knowledge went private and, sun, and silent, and if anything, was what I needed privately to make sure that if I'm going to, going to draw, those drawings were a contribution to these things that hopefully mattered. That is why, and, and this was put in the form of a book, and that book was uh, about mainly a, a manual for doing social housing. That is why we at Elemental opted to call it and actually operate it as a do tank and not as a think tank. Theory from now on, now on was going to be whatever was necessary to think and study and reflect to make the jump into the void of the bank blank page, which means the risk, more precise. But it was going to remain private, never become a discourse or a manifesto.
And I guess ever since, and that's why I say this award is challenging, never ever again we have made any kind of theoretical discourse in a more conventional sense, because if it's there, it's as a way to guide our practice, but never become something in itself, uh, which I may, I think, is a more conventional notion, notion of theory. So, how was that intellectual background of architecture with the capital A going to serve our practice in architecture with the lowercase a? Well, that's the book that Fiden launched today, actually five years ago, uh, five hours ago, which is this book. So it's, uh, we're very happy to finally, it's not a theoretical book, it's a book about sharing the internal cooking of a project that might be useful for all of you that have the problem of the blank page. It, it tried to create, what does it mean to make those choices? What are the moments where you have moved uh, forwards, eventually you realize you made a mistake, you have to move backwards, how do you talk to clients, how do you talk to people? Uh, how your buildings will connect to society and, and be a contribution, and at the same time, keep that integrity from within the profession. Uh, so that's why we're, we're so happy about this book. I, 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 I think there are uh, some of those uh, here uh, outside this room. So, uh, but it just happened and, uh, and actually we made, we coordinated it actually, knowing that the award was going to be given today, we forced ourselves to finally publish the book that, in which we were working for the last four years. Uh, so we're really happy about this. In the end, what we do is to give form to the places where people live. It's not more complicated than that, but also not easier than that. The question is, what informs those forms that we produce? Society expects from us architects the highest standards in aesthetics. And it's true, we have to deliver that. But it's, that is only one of the forces at play. And it's fair enough that society expects us that more artistic approach in the form making. But that is, that is a necessary but not sufficient condition. The economical, political, social, legal, environmental forces inform our forms as well. And that is why at the beginning of every single project, we do not know what the end form is going to be. We spend time in designing the equation, meaning x equal question mark, the form of a project. And we work very hard to try to identify what, are the, what, what is the case to inform the form of this project. Is it budget? Is it timeline? Is it a legal procedure? Is uh, the community that is expecting for many years something? Is the fear of that community? Is it the desire of that community? So it brings together tangible and intangible aspects of a given problem. Uh, that we're trying to give shape uh, while we're designing. So to end, allow me to share with you four examples in, of how uh, we, we've uh, tried to translate that architectural theory and how it has powered our practice. Not, as I said, as a manifesto, but almost as a confession on the internal cooking of a project that might be useful for others that have the problem of the blank page as well. Being the first one, um, and which I picked just some, some of them are in the book, actually. The Laurenciana Stair by Michelangelo. Sorry, that's the book. So, the first example, Laurenciana Astaire. And the title I gave to this example was Being Forced to Look Only with the Eyes, Not with the Mind. What, what did I learn from Laurenciana Astaire? Actually, I have to start by saying, why did I even go to study Laurenciana Astaire? Among all the things that you have to study, why go to the Astaire? I, I was curious about this object that somehow felt too big for the room in which it was. If one looks at the engravings of the, of the Doric temples of Parthenon, for example, you have a, 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 the statue of Athena inside. And if that statue would stand up 
uh, it will go out of the room. Somehow there are objects that are too big for the rooms that they contain. And to me, the Laurentiana there was uh, intriguing in, in that sense. So I went to Florence uh, while being in Venice, um, and this is what I mean, it was very hard to be in a room when you have, you know, a uh, couple of hours away in train that stair. So I went there with my sketchbook uh, um, to there, and when I arrived there, there was a big uh, sign outside saying, no photographs. Fine, I didn't have a, a, a photo camera, so it was okay. I took out my sketchbook and began to draw. The guard approached, said, no, no, no drawing. I mean, look, but there's no, no, no prohibition, nothing like that said in the sign, oh, I can't care less, no drawing. So I took out my measuring tape. No measuring. <laughs> what do you mean no measuring? What can I do then? Uh, well, you, you can only look at the stair. Can I walk up and down? Yes, you can. Uh, so I was forced to count. And uh, the, the interesting thing is, is that I was going up, down, from the center, then on the side. If you go from the center, which is the, actually the, the, the steps are curved, so when you enter the room somewhere here, you naturally will go up that way. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten steps to that uh, middle step that brings together the lateral uh, steps and the central one, ten. If you go from the side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sorry, again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's hidden here. And eleven. From here again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. How come? One of the most repetitive elements in architecture that by definition, if you alter the rhythm, actually they become dangerous, was able to have from the center 10 steps and from the side 11. Was I right? I actually was coming back and forth many times to make sure if, if what was wrong with this thing or how was it possible that one step was hidden only in the distance of 10 or 11 steps? And actually, if you begin to now pay more attention, careful attention, look at the distance between that step and the base of the balustrade, and how distant is that over there? Actually, in the, the introduction of this balustrade over here is to hide the non-coincidence between the lateral steps and the central one. In addition to that, the central stair has grouped stairs, and all of you that have designed a stair know that depending on how much horizontal landings you introduce, the slope of the staircase changes. By having here a continuous flow of, of 10, and here the 10, where the 10 steps were in grouped in 3 plus 7, you in, even increase that slope. So how is it possible that in this stair, this anomaly was introduced? So by starting from the reality and, and actually, well, of course, then I, I, I took advantage of the, the guard at some point had to go to have lunch or, or, or to the bathroom, and I, so I started measuring the thing. I, I also went to the library to understand who has wrote about this thing. Who has, I mean, who can explain why is that thing that like that? There, there was uh, scripts and, and essays by Giulio Carlo Argan, also by Rudolf Wittkover. In none of them was the question of the number of steps mentioned. I mean, uh, particularly the Wittkover essay is a 70 pages article on the Laurentiana stair, mainly on the history of the construction of it, no mention to the architectural facts. This, and this is what we were trying to call an architectural fact. This is a fact that steps are grouped that way. There's 11 on the side, 10 on the center. Why is that? Um, of course, then, if you have access, and this is a, the great thing about Italy, to the original archive of, uh, of Michelangelo, then you understand that he was drawing the stair at the same time he was drawing sculptures. So for him, architecture was mainly a question of muscles, forces, tension, tendons. And the way he achieved, or, or why, why that perception of, oh, fill the room with very little means, well, if you see that curved aspect over here, so that it's like when, when in a sculpture, your, your chest, 
you know, moves forward and then you lean backwards your, your arms. So some tension is introduced. There's a, a, a huge amount of small operations that we're performing as, as if this was a, a body in tension uh, that somehow explain why this room was filled with very apparently inoffensive moves. Actually, at the very beginning, uh, I, when I was only allowed to count, I, I was able to um, acknowledge the fact that it was 11 over here, 10 over there, but when the guard left, I was able to measure it, and actually the stair is not parallel to the side. So hidden in the perspective, that tension of this, between the stair and the room that it contained was explained by how the, oh, oh, everything was skewed somehow. I was, since I was allowed to touch the stair, I was putting my, arm, my hands around, and the diameter of the balustrade in here is 51 centimeters, and the one here in the bag is 37, and actually I could cross my fingers. All of these operations that were hidden, hidden below the threshold of perception uh, in the perspective of the building. So what did I learn from that? that how to fill a room with very little matter, uh, how to deliver with very few means, and this is not that different for what we are required to do in social housing. You are giving very little means, yet you need to make that operation to be able to overcome and take over the built environment. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a distant uh, lesson, yet it is filled with that kind of, this is the way we as architects and designers have to engage uh, with known architectural issues. The second example is the Doric Temple. Um, I was interested in, in this because it's, it's almost the definition of perfection. If in a staircase, it's almost the, the stereotype for repetition, where uh, Doric and uh, Greek architecture is what we have somehow uh, identified as the notion of perfection, identifying all, in addition to that perfection with the re uh, regularity. But that perfection, in the case of the Greek temple, was achieved through a series of anomalies that are all, again, under the threshold of perception. So, there I went, uh, the, in May, uh, the classes are over, first thing I did, to take a train down to Sicily to study the Doric temples in Sicily. Uh, of course, that were, were added to the experience I had in Greece before. So this is what we're all seen, and, and this kind of uh, uh, very regular, perfect architecture uh, that I was interested in understanding and trying to, to extract some lessons from it. So I started just by drawing. This was Segesta uh, in the central, in central Sicily. When, of course, when I was studying in, in Chile, looking at pictures and not even of the books, but the photocopies of the books, you lose all the joints of that architecture. So what was something that was very striking to me was how many pieces of stone were building that architectural knowledge. So actually there were pieces that have a, had a weight, had a proportion, and that could be elevated to that height. Uh, so it was a very practical thing that connected with a very abstract uh, thinking, that of the uh, classical architectural grammar and language. Here there was no guard, incredible. I mean, I would never ever, ever thought to arrive in Sicily, and there you had cows going in between the, the temples so you could measure them uh, very easily. And what struck me was that at the central distance between the columns that were 214, or that is more or less regular here, when you arrive to the corners, this was 2.2 or 2.1. So there was 13 or 12 centimeters difference between the distance in the columns at the center and that on the corners. But you could have never ever, with the bare eye, the naked eye, have thought or, or realized of such, of such difference. Of course, if you have read about it, you have read about all the transgressions to the rule in Doric architecture, but I never, I never had the chance to understand what it meant until I was able to measure the temples. So, yeah, that was the case for the temple in Segesta, and there are many temples that are accessible uh, in Sicily. I, I can't remember which one is which, but again, that anomaly of having 
10 from 12 or to even 20 centimeters, depending if it was a six or eight column uh, uh, temple, was consistent. Over and over, you found that in all the Doric temples in the Sicily. And I guess that where I started to focus then was how was that corner built? How was the, I don't know the name in English, triglyph, is it called like that? And the metopes and the, uh, the rhythm between metopes and triglyphs, which is constant and regular. That doesn't change. What, alter, what is, it begins to be altered are the columns underneath to make sure that the rhythm of how you are telling a myth, and a myth is the ultimate explanation of reality. Reality made sense to Greek because of the myth that was there in the form of Azibu West, the, the screenplay of, of a film. So that myth that was so fundamental couldn't be altered, and the, the, dis, and the rhythm between showing it and not showing it. Actually, from the Valparaiso school, the, the one that was exploring the relationship between poetry and architecture, I remember that the poet those were two founders, an architect and a poet. The poet said that the word, the word meyein, it's an old Greek word for myth that means to blink. So his explanation of the Greek myth as a poet was that reality is so strong, like the sun, if you look at it directly, that you won't be able to resist it. But if you blink or you close your eyes, eventually that same reality, which is the ultimate purpose of a, of a myth, allows you to deal with reality in its most uh, radical form. So I guess that that is why the regular propagation of that rhythm, and the eurythmics of the Doric temple, and that uh, sequence between method and triglyphs had to, had to be not altered, and for guaranteeing that, if you begin to put into the equation, okay, the width of the stone. In the end, you have to arrive to the corner with a stone that has some width. Of course, in paper, it doesn't matter. You don't draw the lines, it's just form. But you have, if you have to build it, then you have some tons that you are able to lift or not. There is a maximum distance between the columns so that we're a system working in pure compression allows for the own weight of the stone not to break it. The, and in addition to that, you have the problem of, okay, if I write to the corner, how do I decide which stone goes in the front, which one has to be cut in the back? I didn't have access to that, uh, but you could tell from with a, with a bare eye, with a naked eye, that the corner of the stone from the front had um, a preference of passage, let's say, uh, compared to the corner, to the stone on the side. But how did they solve the problem with the internal stone, I do not know. Uh, it would be great to be able to go on top of a Greek temple to understand how that corner is built. So actually, after measuring it, if you go backwards to that thing that you've seen as, yeah, this is perfect uh, and perfection, and begin to look at it again, it's obvious now, after having measured it, that the distance between that, uh, those two columns, it's much bigger than the one uh, along these columns, and actually, cutting, the cutting of the stone here, the cutting of the stone there, the cutting of the stone there is always in the axis of the column, but when you arrive to the edge, you can't do that. It has to go beyond the whole capital over here, and actually the stone over here, the, normally the rule would be uh, this piece of stone that is cut here, is had, it has six, how it is it called in, Eng in English? Those, uh, in, in Spanish, the translation will be drops that drops underneath the, metal, the triglyphs. Um, it will be six, three, and three. So that triglyph over here is divided in two of the stone that is built underneath. Three, six, six, three, six, three, three, six, three, and that's the rhythm. When you arrive to the corner, you have three, six, and six. So that stone is slightly longer than the ones from the side, and in order to compensate that extra length, that column has been pushed to the side because in addition you have to turn around. Actually, it's very, it's very precise the way this, it's, it's turned around. The way that triglyph is carved, it has 45 degrees uh, flat, 45 inside, 45 back, and it arrives with a 45 double angle over here. So you have this kind of perfect turning around the column, but all those things are kind of calmly put 
in there with a huge amount of architectural operations that were put into motion by somebody that knew exactly what could be perceived with the naked eye and what couldn't. So I guess that the lesson from here was, and it was connected to maybe one of the problems that we're normally dealing with, <clears throat> A system like the, the Doric one that risks, that is so perfect, that risks to be dead, has a series of imperfections and anomalies that introduces a principle of vitality into the system. That same thing applies when you're working in social housing with repetition. I mean, in order to achieve economies of scale, and I guess this has been the historical criticism to social housing, you are forced to be repetitive, industrialized, uh, things are equal one to the other. And this is, is in, incapable of reacting not only to the diversity of people living inside, but it has some quality that it doesn't want, it's not fair to a, a, a right quality built environment. And the, here it was, this structure, full of anomalies, so that when we said, well, when we are forced to, it's another choice, because of economical reasons to be repetitive, can we introduce some anomalies so that we regain some that of di that vitality of the grid temple? Actually, what I, the, um, the reason for this is not economical. Uh, in the case of that uh, innovation center of the Catholic University in Santiago, um, that building, for different reasons, risked to be a dead structure because its compositional principle was so simple that even a child could follow it. Actually, uh, a, a person that was important in my formative years, and uh, uh, he died, Rafael Iglesias, a brilliant, brilliant Argentinian architect. He had a, a building in Rosario, in Argentina, that he said that this building that was irrational. Uh, it was logic, but irrational. And the reason is that the next move, you don't have to think about it. It's self-explanatory what is the next move. So in a, in a structure that follows such a logic yet irrational compositional principle, we had the risk of having a dead system. For seismic reasons, this, this building also had to be very regular. The moment you offer different amount of mass, well, in Chile, you, you may not know, but the, you know, gr gravity, uh, vertical forces are irrelevant. We, we're, we care about horizontal forces. This building weighs 17,000 tons. If it was a, a glass building, it would have weighed 17,000 tons because the amount of matter you need to resist uh, the acceleration of the ground, it's, it's crucial. And to have it in the perimeter is even more important. And it has to offer, because you never know in which direction the earthquake will come, you have to offer a regular uh, structure uh, from, that, from that point of view. So it risks to be dead. So the only operation we allowed ourselves as a degree of freedom as architects to introduce some of that vitality that we observed in the Doric temple was those two and a half centimeters uh, in the corners of the building. Actually, it's not a straight corner. Uh, if you look at it carefully, it's slightly shifted towards the side below the threshold. Uh, you may not notice consciously, but you go there and for sure something here understands that this building is made out of, of matter, placed uh, in a way that is stacking one on top of the other. The third example is the importance of Arab geometry, uh, particularly in, not only when going to Alhambra in Spain, but also of, of the courses that I, I had at the university by a mathematician, Manuel Corrada, that was exploring uh, the relationship between mathematics and art. Uh, would that, had that possibly can have us as a function uh, then afterwards in your professional life? And I would say, it was about, I went to the Alhambra, of course, to study this. Uh, it was very important, and I was intrigued. I was measuring the, the lion's courtyard, of course, uh, and, and here the, the change of rhythm is evident. So the vibration of the space is, is, is no wonder. I mean, you, you can observe that with a, with a naked eye. Uh, but I, I was more interested in, in how the geometry on the surfaces of, of the Alhambra 
uh, we're exploring how to fill a given surface with one single geometrical shape. And this is a classic problem for Arab geometry. Uh, so be it in that form, uh, in, in, uh, in, in um, uh, matrices uh, of, of three directions or matri matrix of two directions. So these are hiding somehow a square or a triangle in the end. Uh, this is another form, the rotated uh, uh, square. So <clears throat> that apparently absolutely useless knowledge found some, uh, and it was not only there, of course there's a tradition of that. This is Roberto Matas, the uh, engravings of the Quixote series, uh, which uh, I was interested in the background. Again, how with the one or the combination of shapes you can end up filling a given surface. So I guess that this was absolutely crucial for the very first project we did at Elemental, uh, the Quinta Monroy project, which was that $7,500 subsidy with which we have to buy the land. Uh, and actually, if I could have titled uh, uh, a lecture about this, how a square is more efficient than a rectangle to overcome poverty. And the explanation is the following. That city of Iquique in the north of Chile, in the desert, has, let's, let's say, the city where opportunities are concentrated. That's why there's a huge pressure on land to be here. People come to cities looking for those opportunities of jobs, education, healthcare, uh, recreation, transportation, but being the land, and here we are talking about the desert being so scarce, the price of the land was so high, so high that social housing couldn't be built in the center of the city, and it was built in, this, uh, in the upper plateau, 800 meters above the sea level, 16 kilometers away, where the poor were accumulated because their land cost nothing. And the project we we were asked to work with was in the center of the Kike. Actually, the project is somewhere here. It was a slum, and actually the pressure for land explains why the living conditions of that slum are so bad. I mean, people are desperately trying to be included in that network of opportunities. That, that cities concentrate, but land is a scarce resource, so they uh, how is it called? Hacinamiento, uh, uh, it's called uh, overcrowding. overcrowding. Uh, so that's why they're overcrowded, uh, everybody looking uh, for land. The alternative, I mean, when, when land is a scarce, resources, you, uh, a scarce resource, you have two alternatives. You either do it something like that, very bad living conditions due to uh, unhealthy high density, or in the periphery, at the end of the road here, we were competing with this. With $7,000, you could, could build that in a place where land costs nothing. And we had to be able to find the solution for these 100 families to stay in the center of the city in a land in a, that cost three times more than what social housing could normally afford. So this was the condition, the original condition of the site. It's a regular shape. Uh, and 100 families live in here at a density of 700, 500 uh, inhabitants per hectare. Uh, so if one followed the conventional approach, actually that of the housing policy, trying to have a rectangle, a rectangle in principle being more efficient because you serve more families with every linear meter of infrastructure. In a, in a, in a street, the narrower, narrower the lot and the, the bigger the depth, you have more families for a, a, a given amount of square meters of a private lot. So that's why I, you take a look at every single city footprint and you have narrow front, very big depth lots. Uh, it's because of the efficiency of the services on the common spaces of the streets, sewage, electricity, water, whatever. So if we follow that path, and then this first uh, approach, we could accommodate 30 units out of the 100 that were needed to be accommodated if we went to, uh, to the row houses where we were narrowing the size of the lot, and this was part of the policy, to three meter wide, 
three meter being the, not only the, the width of the house, it was the width of a room. So whenever you needed to go to a next room, you had to go through another room. So this is uh, how overcrowding is sometimes, sometimes the cost and the price you have to pay for achieving uh, land efficiency. So our approach goes back to how can we fill the surface with one single shape, and in this case, even though it's counterintuitive, the square was more efficient than the typical uh, rectangle, and the reason was in the irregularity of the uh, shape of the side. When, with a rectangle, whenever you arrive to a corner, you're okay when you're in the middle of the street, but when you arrive to the corner, you have to rotate, and you lose efficiency in that rotation of the rectangle. Well, if you are in a four-side block, that's not that a big deal. But what if you're dealing with a block that had too many corners, though you were forced to rotate very often? In that rotation, the square doesn't care. I mean, it just doesn't matter. So the square proved the most efficient way with one single shape to fill that piece of land, which allowed us to achieve enough density to pay for a very expensive piece of land. And this unconventional approach was due to having made the nerd study of all the possible ways to fill a surface with a given geometrical shape. And because of that, that we were able, with the modest subsidy, we were able to pay land that cost three times more, the families that received the housing solutions did not lose their jobs. And because they did not lose their jobs, they were able to put their own resources into the system right away, instead of being expelled to that underserved periphery. Actually, to the point that that first half of the unit, this is an apartment, there's a house underneath, so uh, a house that owns that property and another apartment that owns that property, in the best of the cases, we were able to build 36 square meters, but we left the void, that void over here. So actually, that apartment was expanding to this side, that one to that side, this one to that side. You can see, this is concrete, this is a partition wall. That one is a, a panel made out of, out of almost nothing, because we knew families were going to double the size of that unit to 72 uh, square meters uh, if they didn't lose their jobs. So that's why location was so crucial. So if the cost of that first half of the house was $7,000, these units nowadays, and a real estate person will tell you well, on what that, that does, does depend, the value of that property, location, location, location. And because of that location, where land is a very scarce resource, if you go now into the market and want to buy one of those things, the cost is $80,000. And so this is the way policies in the, in the developing world are property oriented, unlike the UK or Europe uh, where housing is owned by the state. When you get a subsidy in the developing world, you become owner of the house. So it's the biggest transfer of public funds into a family asset, and one would like that asset to grow its value over time. All of us, when buying a house, were expected to grow its value over time. In social housing, that is closer to buy a car than buying a house. The value goes down because they're in underserved peripheries. Nobody wants to live there. Uh, so I guess that more than in the architecture, except for the surge of dense enough projects able to pay for expensive land without overcrowding, with the possibility of expansion, this is the triad that we were trying to solve, uh, we were able to uh, ha accommodate the families in the city center and have that value gain as a direct transfer and make housing become not just a, a shelter against the environment, but a tool against poverty. And finally, and this is maybe the first time we've talked about this, uh, in the end, this thing had to have a form. And uh, back to, it's not just old architecture, but more recent architecture, I remember having been very much impressed by Adolf Loos, Tristan Zara House in Paris, and I was interested in this operation where, you know, this house has seven stories, but the, the, the voids or the, the puncturing of the wall is grouped in such a way 
that a new scale has been introduced. Actually, you have here at least two stories. Over here, these are these guys as something as being part of that basement, and again here. Uh, so that operation of introducing a giant order is not just from Palladio, also uh, somebody like Laws did it in this house uh, in the 20th century. Something that for sure Caesar may have known as well. I mean, that grouping and introduction of a different scale. And of course, at a, at a, very, at a much more modest scale, that same operation was done with a modest means uh, that we had, which is grouping those windows. That was the only degree of freedom we were given as architects. And the introduction of that kind of giant order, that, I mean, this is mainly about the paint in between the windows. That's what you're given, nothing more than that. But we knew that it was very unlikely that if we do this double height kind of or, uh, element, architectural element over here, none of that would have ever happened in the second half of the house. So by in the kind of silence or the void in between self-expressive architecture, we could introduce something that had some civic scale. We thought we had a responsibility with the urban, uh, with the city, by introducing something that, given that we were unable to know, this was uncertain, if people do whatever they want, will that first have frame that in a way or introduce a new order of some civic scale. So that same operation had been over and over done in our projects, even with different designs. This was after the earthquake and tsunami reconstruction in the south. And again, in that new order does not necessarily appear in the second half of the houses, but somehow this uh, keeps that uh, double height. You may not say, and that's it? I mean, so what? Uh, I, for us, it's very important to overcome the so what question. Ourselves try to put all the time on projects. I mean, if we're going to do this and that, so what? This was a project we did uh, in Santiago in the most expensive neighborhood. They're proving maybe the, to, the, to the extreme, the point of paying for very expensive land. In here, the double height in the, in the second and third floor window. When this is not done, and these were some, some church organizations that uh, we were working on in the end. We decided not to work anymore, and they took our designs and decided to uh, use them on, on their own. Fine. Uh, but look, what they did not do was to group that window in here, so the more typical floor-by-floor -floor kind of scale uh, is there, and maybe this is not the most radical example, when, when this is another project in Santiago, the double scale window over there. It's exactly the same design. They just decided not to paint the space in between the windows. So what is missing somehow is that civic scale that we were looking for uh, and for us, uh, that even minor, minute, uh, small introduction of some civic quality into the built environment was maybe the only degree of freedom that we found and, and I guess theory was crucial to have achieved that. Uh, hope, and, and this gives us a lot of hope. Um, and you see here the consequence of when people decide, for example, they decide to paint the facade in red. Uh, and they didn't keep the, the, the color difference between what created the double height window and this one. But that guy understood intuitively <laughs> that that had some value for the public realm, and I guess that's what we're ultimately all trying to do. Try to, with our uh, specific knowledge, try to make some contribution to common good. Thank you so much. Good evening. Um, I'm torn between my first question and pouring myself a glass of water. <laughs> but I've known you a long time. I think we've known each other for 10 years. And um, I never expected this. I, never, I saw a new Alejandro tonight that I've never met before. Alejandro the nerd. <laughs> and um, it's a really pleasant surprise, actually. And also difficult for me, you know, because I think this is a topic that um, Charles, whose place is empty tonight, would have really relished getting into with you, and, this, and I never knew Alejandro, the classicist. Um, but what I would say is that um, 
What I always said about you is that you're a very good communicator. One of your, one of your real talents, apart from architecture, is as a communicator. And you said something, I remember a very short speech you gave here at the RIBA several years ago when I think you were being honored in a different way, probably a, an RIBA medal or something. And you said, I'm at the Royal Institute of British Architects. And in Spanish, royal is real, and real is real. And I think what you showed here tonight is how you can translate classicism into reality, into, you know, you can always, your work is so grounded in the real. And I think that's why we appreciate your work. It's certainly why I have um, been interested in your work for all these years. Um, so while I pour myself a glass of water, maybe you could talk <laughs> about turning classicism into the real. Um, I would like to start with the first uh, statement you made that, uh, me being a, com a good communicator. Uh, and I think it's important to double click on that. Um, I would say that this is just a consequence of going back to Fernando Perez's uh, lesson. Think carefully. If you think about the problem carefully, if you try to identify what are the terms of the equation that you are asked to solve, if you then can, are accountable for those terms that you yourself agreed, not with yourself, but with the uh, people that you're working with, other professionals, the community, the, the commissioner, the client, whatever it is. Then no wonder it is easier to explain it, because it's a way we use to explain ourselves and to direct our infinite chain of, of decisions that I was trying to describe uh, as part of the blank page thing. You can get lost at every single moment of that forking paths chain of decisions, of creative decisions. Uh, so how to keep track of how to, again, recognize the moment where you began to make the wrong decision? Uh, so to have thought carefully about, first of all, what's the problem? Second, what are the pertinent tools to address that problem? Among all the tools you have, and that's why I guess uh, we, we make those studies in, not just in classicism, let's say, but in things that all the others have done, it just offers us more tools from which to pick when we're facing a problem and trying to narrow or lower the risk of making the wrong decision. I mean, sometimes you are too in love with the tools you took just because they looked right. Uh, so the question is, okay, is this the best tool for that problem? And I guess that if you've thought about, and theory in that sense would, be, would, be, would play that role, uh, if you thought carefully about the problem and then the tools, then you can more easily recognize uh, when your decision was just based on, on other agendas. Sometimes, sometimes it's fine. I mean, it's because I like it that way. Uh, but then have to be very uh, open to recognize that it's just because of taste. Uh, don't discuss, disguise that. Um, so um, the, the communication thing, I guess, it's something that we were required to develop because the nature of the projects that we do very rarely have another architect on the other side of the table. And unless you are able to communicate in simple terms without reducing the complexity of the challenge that you're facing, you're not going to be allowed to keep on moving forward. It's about funding, getting permissions, uh, having people using their energy. I mean, it's so difficult to put one brick on top of the other. I mean, it's, it's really a tough issue. So unless you channel other people's forces and capacity, uh, you're never going to get there. Uh, eventually, you may be given uh, one or two times, or if you, you rely on the power of the brand, yeah, this is an original by X or Y architect. But very rarely, the really tough problems will get that permission to become a reality uh, because there are just too many people involved. And I guess that the only way we've found is to think carefully and because of that to explain that carefully so that people are on our side 
in the effort of making things become that reality that you were mentioning before. The other thing that I thought was so interesting about the way you approached the lecture tonight, which in a way was an attempt at a kind of classic architecture lecture, um, was the mathematics. Because it, it never struck me before how appropriate it was that your first building was the mathematics faculty. But actually, everything you talked about tonight was mathematics. And whether it was counting you know, Michelangelo's steps or the, the spaces between the triglyphs and metopes. Um, and it's that the way you translate that, I guess it's the fact that you're always thinking about an equation. And this is what you have, in a way, you've built a career around equations, right? So you have $7,500 uh, to buy the land. You have X thousand dollars for a subsidy. The two things don't match up. How do, you, how do you square that circle? You have to build half of a good house, right? That was always, that used to be your mantra. You didn't say it tonight, but half of a good house. Um, and I think it's possible to look at those houses in Quinta Monroy, which I visited, and not see what you did there, actually. I mean, people see the voids and they understand that the self-build aspect, but they don't understand the mathematics. And maybe you could talk about that briefly, because I think the mathematics is what has made your practice. Um, yeah, you're right. I never thought that the mathematics building may have had an influence. Uh, you know, mathematicians uh, described themselves when I got that commission as machines of transforming coffee into equations. And I get that that had a very fundamental truth. Around the coffee, there's the social dimension. I mean, the mathematicians, they work in such an abstract things, isolated in their own cell. Actually, that first building was mainly individual cells for these researchers and professors. The moment they went out of the room, to the coffee, the cafeteria. That was the moment where knowledge was shared and was, you know, clashing. Or, or the moment you said, "What are you working on?" You know, that thing. About, uh, there were not even numbers on the on the uh, boards. Uh, it is so abstract that one would have expected to have numbers in the boards. There were no numbers. Uh, that moment where somebody could say. Have you heard about the last thing that this other guy did? Or that, that, that moment of sharing, I think it's crucial. And I think it's, it might have, it may be the explanation why I mentioned Harvard. Uh, when you're going out of your comfort zone and you're not competing with other architects, but you're competing with other professions for who is going to decide the built environment. And this was somehow a desperate feeling I had. Uh, again, I'm being the architect in the table, engineers and lawyers discussing the really tough issues of the world, and you as an architect, yeah, you know, when we have more time and more money, we may call you. This is real stuff. Uh, so I felt the need, and maybe mathematics or the language of economics was the, the only bridge I found to be able to engage into that conversation. No wonder one of the founders of Elemental is a transport engineer, Andres Jacobelli. And for him, it's kind of natural to frame a problem in terms of what are the constraints. This may be the most important thing, the constraints. We, we were trained as architects we, uh, under the, the, the assumption that in order to make your private creativity flow, uh, fly free, Constraints were removed. Uh, so gradually, when you grow, move uh, up in the career, they, you may have more dimensions to your thing, like the uh, construction, never budget, uh, construction or uh, some laws. But in case the, the project began to look ugly, then you can change the constraints. Uh, and this is something that, what, for, from what I understood, from Andres' uh, conversations with that around the coffee uh, with him, is that an engineer is required to be creative because of the constraints. So the moment you begin to chart your question with the constraints is the moment where creativity is needed, is mostly needed. And the constraints, the, maybe the easiest way to measure is through mathematics, through budget, through time frame. Uh, 
over time, we understood maybe intuitively and now is more conscious that in that equation, and, and we like to frame, to put it in the form of an equation, not because we believe it's a science, but that because of the terms that you identify are the ones that you then are accountable for. So people can ask, so if you decide in your equation, what will inform the form of this project? The structure, budget, time frame, uh, the weather in this part of the, of the country. Uh, so then when you produce a form, okay, they go with a checklist that you yourself created. Okay, what about the structure? How is it performing in terms of seismic behavior? Uh, the weather, is it sustainable or not? Uh, how much energy am I consuming because of the choices you made? So it allows the accountable um, performance of the building be shared with the ones that are going to end up using it. The thing is that among those terms of the equation are things that are hard to measure, like the character of a building. You enter something and the first thing that strikes you is you don't like it. You can't explain why, but it's just a sad building or an oppressive building. Or if you try to transform that into a method, you're dead. I mean, the, the moment you try to grasp all dimensions, as a, as a, I mean, because I want to do a happy building, I'm going to use colors. I mean, that cliche for sure will lead you to a wrong answer. Uh, or the uh, decoration, because I want to have a building that is more connected to people. And, and this is what I was meaning with the fight of the, against the cliche. Uh, knowing that those intangible dimensions are crucial they're unspeakable certainties. They operate, but it's very hard to put a word on it, yet they're part of that equation. So I guess that what it, what is what it makes it an art and not a science, besides the fact that there's one, not one single possible correct answer for that X. You do fight for the decoration, though. I mean, I, th I think, you know, I remember conversations we've had where, I'm thinking back to, Quinta Monroy, and the way that people completed those buildings and embellished those buildings, that was something that you felt was crucial to the expression of that project. And in later projects, when you didn't give people the chance to do that, because actually the subsidies were going up in Chile, Chile was getting richer and there was more money, or there was more money for housing anyway. And so eventually they just wanted nice houses from you. They didn't want this radical half-house solution where people had to complete it themselves and fill it with this wildly unpredictable vernacular styling. You were deeply disappointed, I think. So can you tell us a little bit about what you learned watching people fill the voids that you created? Well, first of all, it would have been impossible for us to tailor-made 100 different solutions, and not even our, in our wildest dreams we would have ever go to the way people are finishing. Uh, but in addition to that, is that it's no wonder the built environment, is, it becomes such an extension of your personal reality. And I guess that if you're trying to apply your personal taste to that, uh, it's very likely that you're going to fail. I guess that we are more efficient in using your, where you, our own knowledge um, in creating things that will stand the test of time. And I'm very skeptic, going backwards to that attitude, rebellious attitude, of, of our own taste. Um, it has happened, maybe, um, that's a part of, the, of the, um, the formative years that I skipped, even though it's in the book, uh, some years that I quit it from architecture. Uh, I started by building, maybe many architects start like that, uh, shops, restaurant, uh, uh, discotheques, uh, um, interior design, and uh, all sorts of, of, of shitty stuff that luckily enough disappeared. Uh, so all the anxiety of proving that you have all this talent and skilled capacity of, of producing forms was out of my system when I was asked to do the first serious project, which, which was the mathematics faculty. And, and one of the things while going through the sketches in, of this exercise of scanning that and having finally an archive, was how embarrassing all, the, all those designs from the 
early 90s were. And at the time, I was convinced these were pretty cool. I mean, I thought this is, you know, what I started for. And uh, after, after years, I mean, it, it looks so dated. So uh, uh, that's from the 90s kind of thing. And I guess that architecture, particularly if you built it properly, uh, you want it to last as much as possible, not, at, not just in physical terms, but also in cultural terms. Uh, and I guess, I guess that taste is something that you better not trust. Uh, of course, at some point, taste is, is like your handwriting. You can't avoid it. I mean, you're recognized uh, because of your handwriting. So if it's going to be there anyhow, why even pay attention to that? Let's focus on things that are more crucial. Uh, and I guess that this is the trade-off. Okay, we will take care of some parts of the construction. But sometimes if it's an institutional building, it's the whole building. If it's housing because of the constraints, we wish we could do that, uh, but there's not enough resources. And even if there was resources, what we learned from that is that the historical criticism to social housing is that in the search for economy, it had to go for repetition, and it left out the variety of preferences, taste, family structures, people wanting to have a business at home, people that have animals, people with a lot of children, elderly. I mean, it's, it's so vast that you can't do that. So knowing that the historical criticism to social housing was the incapacity to react to that diversity in the problem of not having enough resources was the solution of that historical criticism. So why make, again, the same mistake? Let's keep on focusing on what's the solution of, not, of that incapacity to react to variety. And if I'm given $20,000, I'm going to spend them in a better located piece of land and an even better initial part of the house so that it can trigger the next half if families didn't lose their jobs in the process. So we talked about the mathematics, and the reason why that being important is that you operate in a condition of scarcity, so of course equations are essential, but the other characteristic that I find in your work, at least early on, is this self-initiation. And I wrote a book a few years ago called Radical Cities, you were one of the main characters, and one of the things I was arguing was that in those conditions of scarcity, the architect can find ways to intervene. Not always, but sometimes. And that the architect can be a kind of bridge between people's own energies and capacities, because we know that people can build their own homes on a massive scale. On, urban, on an urban scale, people can build their own homes. Mm. But they can't necessarily build themselves infrastructure or a transport network yeah. or, a, or a nice, you know, or a well-balanced community. Um, so, this idea that the architect can intervene, you did it in Kinta Monroy in a way, I think. I mean, you, you certainly cr you created, you lobbied for that project. You really pushed for it. How prevalent is that in your practice now, and how important is it, do you think, for architects to behave like that in those circumstances? Well, today in this room is one-third of our office. So we're 15. We're uh, a big enough practice to be able to deal with complex projects but not that big that we need projects we want projects and the, it's, it's, it's a privilege and we are very conscious about the privilege that we have more requests than what we can deal with and the way we choose projects is according to the level of ignorance we have about those fields uh, we go into things that need knowledge to be created, they need lobbied. And so the, the question is actually not there yet. This X equal question mark, nowadays in our practice, does not only apply to the form of the building, it applies to the fact that even the client doesn't know what the question is. We have actually, we were required to package and invent a procedure that we called the workshop elemental, we. So whenever somebody arrives to us saying, look, I would like to do something in this part of the city, but I'm not sure what it is needed. 
it could be infrastructure, it could be a public space, it could be housing. Depending on if you go there, swallow constraints, legal frames, uh, but also talk to people. Is this people angry? Is this people, uh, the level of resentment is in insecure? I mean, am I scared while walking into this uh, street? So you, so you try to identify before into the form, this equal is the question. And normally we create a possibility to work where in principle there shouldn't have been one. Um, and I guess this is, even to ourselves, has proved to be something because you're building that question with clients, users. Uh, first of all, you're agreeing what is the problem that we have. And only then we move ahead. And uh, I think it has proved over in very different realms from Artemide to uh, identify what it could have been a lamp, a technology, or a, a system to the Inter-American Development Bank in Buenos Aires, for example, where they, in a very bold decision, they, the president of the bank wanted to have their headquarters in the middle of the biggest slum in Buenos Aires. Uh, but they were not sure if it was right or not or what the benefit of, of that, it was a powerful message. But if it didn't deliver any improvement, both for the bank, but for the community, it would have been a, a white elephant kind of, of approach. It would have been a disaster for other institutions wanting to do the same. So when going to the X equal, should we even do that? What is the question here? What is the problem that we're trying to address while building a building inside a slum? And the conclusion was that there was no building needed. Actually, the way we framed that project was a building inside the slum will need a pedestrian bridge across the railroads because it was disconnected from the city. It will need parking, otherwise people cannot even come to work. And because of all these conditions, and even with all of these conditions, this may have never produced the positive impact the bank wanted to have because it's a development bank. They themselves said, yeah, we're a bank, but we're a development bank. So we should be doing things differently. And our proposal was that the building itself was the connection to the city. It's a pedestrian bridge, and the bank somehow operates within the infrastructure that now connects the slum with the city. That was not there before. And actually, to the point that we had to change the law, never in Argentina before, the air rights above the railroads was, uh, was uh, available for building. And in order to have that building to connect the slum with the richest part of the city where all the, these people work and that the city benefits from these this people, we had to change the law. So it required literally you know, convincing, politically lobbying with people so that we create room where in principle there was none. I'm being given signals to, um, to wrap it up, but I have a final question for you, which is that you were part of a you are part of a generation in South America that has done extraordinary things in the last decade, I would say. Um, there have definitely been some extraordinary uh, experiments in housing and in urban planning and, and generally in trying to remediate um, urban poverty and segregation in, in these cities. And I wonder whether you feel the energy is still there. And it has to be a quick answer. But... Yes. <laughs> 